outstanding. Hello, my friends. I call you blessed in Jesus' name. Hello, everybody all over the world, man. Call you guys blessed in Jesus' name. Welcome to Open Door Church. I want to encourage you guys to come out. If you're ever in Fort Worth, Dallas area, come out and find us here in, in Burleson, Texas. And we promise you, man, we will love on you. We sure will. Friends, uh, several years ago, the Lord began to open up some amazing doors for me. And I began to meet all kinds of really cool people. And in the midst of this, because we had just been isolated for a long, long time, all the way up until the time that I was 50 years old, we were just incredibly isolated. We were doing incredible works all over the world, but it was, you know, in really bad places all over the world, like, like the works that we're still doing today. But in but the year that I turned 50 years old, which is 2016, all that changed in a radical way. Now, there's a number of factors as for that. But one of the things that happened is God Almighty began to open up doors and actually allow us to impact the body of Jesus all over the world. Not just as the body of Jesus impacting the world and those who have been lost and forgotten and condemned and abused and ostracized and all those people that you and I go after, but we actually began to, to, to be able to see a footprint in the body of Jesus itself. And that just makes me so excited. I get so thrilled about that. And then I began to meet next level leaders that are in the body of Jesus that I didn't know anything about. And I was like, whoa, look at this guy. Whoa, look at this girl. Oh my goodness. People that are just so healthy to be around. Friends, I want to just tell you, I met a guy by the name of Brian Swartz. And Brian Swartz is a prophetic he is someone, he's a prophetic individual. He carries the mantle of the Lord on him in such a cool way. He's a next level daddy. He is a next level husband. He loves his bride. Together they got a whole slew of children. He was actually an NFL football player for I think five or six years. He was with the Jags. And when I say that this guy is a next level guy, I, it's, it's really hard for me to actually articulate that. The people that he has influence on and the, and the circles that he moves in. But I also want to tell you this. He is so down to earth. And he is just so, man, I'm just a dude. And I just want to be a friend to people. I want to make impact. I want to raise my kids in a way that looks more like heaven than it looks like hell. You know, he actually said something the other day that totally blew my mind. We we're talking about raising kids and just talking about values and all this. He said, you know what? He said, I've told my sons and told my daughters, stay fiercely loyal to King Jesus, even in your sin. I was like, yes. Even if I make my bed in hell, there you are, King Jesus. Right? Just teach your kids this fierce loyalty to the Lord. And say, listen, this is your tribe. You are a Jesus person. As you change and as you develop and as you struggle and as you walk through things, yeah, you're going to have issues, but don't ever let it be that you have bailed upon the hope that you have and the relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was like, bro, if I don't hear anything else today, that right there was so worth hearing. Guys, he's actually here inside the house right now, and he's with us. Guys, I'd like to introduce to you my good friend, Brother Brian Swartz. So let's give a great big open door welcome. Brother Brian. Okay, just wait, hang on, just wait, just wait. There's a reason I don't like him on the same stage as me. Can I have a hug, Brian? Hang on, wait. Mm. Thank you, Lord. That is so humiliating. You edifying, build me up. <laughs> Dude. Look, look at it. I look like a little boy standing next to him. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Everything's okay. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> hey, man, it's such a, I'm, I'm so glad to have you with me, man. I mean it. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be with you, man. Um, I was just, during worship time, thinking about the value of relationship. And uh, I'll be straight up with all of you. Like, it doesn't come natural for me. I grew up in such a way where you just fend for yourself Anybody that is an ally is eventually an enemy. And I learned, I've, I've had to lean into the Spirit of God to like grow in my relational capacity. And uh, I just want to thank you for being a good friend. Oh, Brian. No, so for real, it's because you don't, you don't have many. That's what I'm seeing in life. I don't mean you. I mean me. I mean generally. Let me rephrase that. 
<laughs> that, that sounded really bad. I yeah. mean, we, you're welcome. You, you don't, you're, you're, you're welcome. You don't get many friends, like true friends. <laughs> I, I'm trying to like yeah, dig out. I meant me. You, I don't have I very many meant. friends. I tell you, I tell you, but because it's like the value system of the kingdom is radically different than the value system of this age we're in. And we are designed by God and we're on an assignment to demonstrate tangibly, you touched on it a little bit, how do we bear his name with accuracy? How do we walk in relationship to where when somebody that doesn't have a clue about who Yahweh is, who Jesus is, who the Spirit of God is, and we live in such a way that somehow in them it triggers something, I gotta have that God. Amen. I mean, how do we do that in our marriages? How do we do that with our kids? Because for, for years raising your kids, it's like as long as they're well behaved in public, <laughs> you know, you develop a methodology trying to navigate their weaknesses instead of developing a methodology amplifying who they are in Christ. So good. Sometimes the church, we can do that. We set up whole systems to like make sure people behave well. Yeah. And we make the cross about individual sin and just getting out of, out of freedom from sin instead of understanding the magnitude of what the cross is all about and the resurrection of Jesus. And so it's, I'm in a season, you know, the start of this year, I got COVID. I couldn't come to your conference. I got hit with the, what is it, the Omicron or whatever it was, strain. Um, it, it, a lesser athlete would have struggled more, but it, 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 it got yes. me decent. Yes. But that happened, and then I was moving my son up, a life transition. My oldest son was going to college. Uh, I've got seven children. I've got three girls, and then I've got four boys. And uh, yeah, thank God for prolific breeding. And um, it, it's, it, it was a life transition, you know, a tearing. You send one out. And uh, my son Hayden, I'm moving him into Minnesota. I get a phone call. And on the phone call, I, I'm, I'm notified that I'm no longer employed. And, and the ministry and the church and stuff that I was a part of is getting blown up. And it didn't have much to do with me. I say much, but I'm sure something will happen that says I had something to do with it. But it was, it was like all this stuff hit in 2022 at the beginning of the year. And I remember flying back home and the Spirit of God just ministering to me going, this is your hour. Not to reach nations. When you get home, you have the opportunity to represent me to your wife and kids. And you have to be a rock. And my kids didn't even know I wasn't working. It wasn't shame. It was like, God's got this. I have such an opportunity to manifest peace when it's chaos. And it's like these dark things we go through, ladies and gentlemen, they're invitations to manifest who he is. Hey, okay. I'm walking off stage. No, I, I just... I want you to keep but, preaching. But you're a part of... I, you I keep, keep, as you go, Troy is a part... You're a part, like... If I didn't have friendships like this, and I'm going through this, and I don't have somebody that I can be real with, yeah. raw with, vulnerable with, and just hear me out, and not, not manufacture some self-help methodology to make me feel better, yeah. but to just listen and go, I'm in this with you, I got your back, whatever you need. Like, like that's amazing. And that's rare. And so part of this is like getting with the people that are willing to like, here's what I would say, I was thinking about, I was, uh, is the reason my marriage after 27 years has grown these last five years is that Diane has been able to look at all of my weaknesses, all of my sin, because weaknesses usually produce sinful activity, right? And not let those things define her side of the relationship. So good, man. So good. And that's King Jesus. Like, the Father knows you, you have sin in your life right now. You have weaknesses in your life right now. You know you do. 
And he doesn't allow your weaknesses and your sin to define his side of how he rules your relationship. So good, bro. All right, now get out of here. <laughs> you have one of the finest pastors, plural, like, not just Pastor Troy, but Leanna, you have like, he's, if you've been here long enough, you've had to adjust to his growth and development. This is how it works, it, it, should, it has to work in church, just like in parenting. My kids, I'm not the same dad I was 10 years ago, but I did things 10 years ago that maybe gave them a wrong picture of who the father was. And so they're still stuck there. If you've got a good relationship, they'll articulate that, be honest, you'll have a moment to recognize it, repent of it, come, come, come out of agreement with it and start again. But I've also had to have those moments as I've been revealed to me, has been revealed to me my weaknesses and what it led to and the harm it and stuff it did in their lives. I repent of that, I acknowledge it. I don't say that wasn't real, it was real. I was a different dude. I was struggling with certain things. And I'm sorry that that have impacted you and made you get stuck and, and gave you a weird view of God. And that's super helpful to your kid to be able to acknowledge that. Some of you will never get that from your parents. And some of what they did totally jacked you up and gave you such a weird perspective of who the father is. And you're still dealing with it. God's gonna heal you during this service. I'm, I'm telling you, you're gonna hear some things. The Spirit of God's gonna go, I'm just gonna heal your broken heart. Because all it's gonna do is give voice to your pain. And then I, I would usually wait after those moments, about two weeks, and then I'd call him back up and I'd say, okay, let's talk. How are we gonna do this now going forward? Because I'm not that same dude. So you can't keep living as if I'm that same dude. You have to adjust to my growth just like I have to adjust to your growth. And you've had the privilege, if, you've been, if you don't bail on preachers too soon. See, some of you bail on, bailed on pastors that they were in development phase and you mistook their weaknesses and their sin issues during their development time and you quite frankly, where you were at in your life, you just didn't want to mess with it. I understand that. But if you're gonna do this for the long haul, you're gonna to have to make constant adjustments to your leader's weaknesses and then their growth and development. You've got a pastor that's not afraid to be real and honest about where he's not. That's a gift. And so I don't know why this is coming out of me right now, but this is for somebody because you're carrying hurt into different environments and people that misrepresented the father totally messed up your theology. And he's coming as a dad today and going, that hasn't defined our relationship. Romans 8, 28. I love this. We all love this passage, don't we? The title of this message is Name, Image, Likeness. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things, everybody say all things. all things. Work together for what? Good. Some of you are going through things and have gone through things where in your heart this scripture is a joke. It's just a good scripture to memorize. But this is the guarantee when you're born again you start entering into a relationship with the creator God, the supreme being of all the universe, and he guarantees one thing. Everything that you go through in this age, he is working it together for your good. And he builds into his relationship with you the reality that you don't believe that. 
at different times. You don't believe that. Aren't you glad he builds into that relationship like any good dad? Yeah, there's going to be times my kids doubt my goodness. Because I reveal to them the consequences of some of their issues. Don't let the father reveal the things that are consequences of very real issues in your life. Don't mistake that for rejection. Embrace that as a good father reveals to his son and daughter where he's out of alignment, not to torment, not to reject, not to condemn, but to instruct them in his ways so that they grow and develop. He needs the church to grow up right now. He needs his bride to grow in her understanding of who he is and his ways. And, and Paul goes on and he keeps speaking about this promise. He says, for those who love him, right, and were called according to his purpose. And then he goes on and says, for those whom he foreknew, before you made one mistake, before you had one issue, he knew you. Before you had any opportunity to have any, any issues or any good things or bad, he knew you. That's astounding to me. Imagine if your wife knew you when you weren't in sin. Imagine if you knew, you knew your wife before she'd ever made one mistake in your marriage. He has this beautiful ability to see us before any of the issues showed up, just like with Adam and Eve. He had the opportunity, we don't know how long that was, that was eternal. He had the opportunity to be in relationship with those he created before they ever ate of that tree. And then they eat of it, they make the mistake, they have the fall, and he still has that vantage point. When you're born again, it, it, you're born again, you've been, become a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, right? You're literally reset back to original purpose and intent. And he relates to you only based, in his foreknowledge in your current life, he only relates to you based upon who you're becoming, not who you were. That's what a good dad does. He looks at his kids and he doesn't mistake the current weaknesses and sin he sees. He doesn't make the mistake of defining that relationship based upon that moment. He looks at his kid and he goes, that is ugly, that doesn't look like me. That's not what looks like the father. But, <laughs> but, no, for real, listen to me, this is huge. But I look at my sons and they are fiercely loyal to me. They would never wanna do anything to let me down. And so when they let me down, my response is everything. You're gonna do things that you perceive in your mind are gonna disappoint and let the father down. And the reality is, he has this capacity, even if he was disappointed, simultaneously he's so good that he doesn't let any of the disappointment overwhelm his patience, his goodness, his kindness, his self-control. He's able to navigate through that. That's so important. And those he foreknew, it says, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. When you're born again, everything needed to grow up and become like him is in you through the Spirit. Regardless of your pedigree spiritually, regardless of your upbringing, everything needed, the Spirit of God in your life is like him signing, and signing your image. I've had the rare privilege, privilege playing professional football. I know what it's like for somebody to call me up and go, hey, Brian, we're gonna use you in the next Madden football game. We're gonna use your image, we're gonna use your likeness, we're gonna use your name. I have the rare privilege of somebody calling me up to pay me to use my name 
to use my image and to use my likeness. That's pretty cool. I'm going to be in the Madden football game. They're number 58. I'm going to be right there. If you go back from 95 to 2000, I'm, I'm the middle linebacker on the Jaguars. Number 58. They used my name, used my image, used my likeness, and paid me really good for it. Israel's been trapped in slavery for a long time. And then God raises up this guy, right? Named Moses. And on the way to meet the people he's about to deliver, he has an encounter with God in Exodus chapter 3, and Yahweh reveals his personal name to Moses. The other gods, the, the, the other inferior gods that are all over this world, all over this planet, they're real. But they are so inferior, they never reveal their name. There's always pseudo names. Yahweh is the only God that comes to humanity and reveals his actual name because in the name is who the person is. He says, when, I, when you go tell them that I am has sent you. I am this way and I will be this way for you. I'm never changing, never shifting. And he brings them out of slavery, right? He pulls them out of slavery and brings them to the mountain. And he goes, Moses goes up to the mountain and God tells him certain words and he says, listen, tell the people this. Tell them they're my treasured possession. Tell them they're to be kings and priests unto me. My desire is that everybody prophesy, that everybody's a king, everybody's a priest. But he, he has this order, he delivers. He sets his affection on us. And then he gives them instructions. Right? He gives them those commandments. We call them laws. The better translation is instructions. And he says, listen, if, if I'm sending you on a mission to represent me, I'm going to tell you and give you insight into how that's a good dad. The best coaches I ever had let me know exactly where I was at at all times. There's no mystery with Yahweh. Every other God, there's nebulous things. There's mystery. They always keep you insecure, not knowing where you really stand with them. And they demand crazy sacrifices. And Yahweh comes. And don't forget creation when he said, let's form them in what? Our image and in our likeness. And he makes humans distinct from every other creature. He takes Israel and makes her distinct from every other nation. He sets his affection on her, and then he brings her to the mountain and says, this is how my ways work. He says, don't have, why would you ever go after these inferior gods? They're ridiculous. All they do is enslave you. And then he says, don't make any image, don't, don't make any drawings or images have you ever had one of your kids, man, when they were like four or five, they, they come to you with a picture and they go, look, Daddy, I drew you. <laughs> and it's literally a three-headed monster. And I'm like, buddy, you nailed it. Perfect. As a dad, you're like, because that's what immature kids do. They try to fabric, and, and you end up creating an image that's not him. Every other God has these images of them that are like half human, half animal. That reveals how inferior they are. Because the animals are distinct from the human. Distinction. And by the way, holiness is not behavior. Holiness is distinction. He's saying you're a holy people. You're distinct. And this is how a loved, holy, distinct people lives. And then that third command, that command where that, that instruction says, don't bear my name in vain. And we in the West have interpreted like that, just don't say Jesus Christ in a mean way. Don't say, God damn it. Some of you will be offended that I said that in church. Because you've been trained that that is how you don't take his name in vain. Do you know how many people don't do that? and misrepresent him? 
Taking his name in vain is bearing, lifting, carrying. It's your life that includes your speech. And so he says, don't bear my name. So you're going to be sent into these hostile territories. I've assigned you to reach the nations in how you guys do life together and how people see you doing life with me is going to determine whether or not they want to come and serve me. This is not about being better little girls and better little boys for daddy. This is not about your behavior. How many of you are loyal to Jesus? Six of you, this is gonna be a... No, how many of you are like, I'm loyal to Jesus, he's got me. Now, with the same zeal, how many of you have misrepresented him? Woo! Yeah! Aren't you glad Jesus in John 20 comes to these disciples that are humiliated? One of their best friends just killed himself. Shows up after the tomb, resurrected, just pops in and reveals his wounds. And he's like, hey, peace, guys. Look, look, check this out. Look at, look at my side. And instantaneously they're healed. Then he does something, he leans over and he breathes on them and he gives them the spirit. It's like him taking a picture of them and signing his signature over their lives. When I would do card signings, I'd get paid for it. And then if they had pictures, they had to pay more because adding my signature to my image increased the value. Number six, the prayer. Lord bless you, Lord keep you, Lord make his face shine upon you, the Lord turn his countenance to you, the Lord give you shalom. And then right after it says, may he write his name over you. His signature on your image skyrockets the value of who you are. It takes faith and courage to believe that even when you are in weakness and sin and struggling with addiction and struggling with habits, it takes faith to believe that it's his name on you that gives you the value, not your corresponding habits. He would love to see you because that's what he said. If, if, you, if you start growing up into who he is, you start recognizing, oh, that's how he used my abuse issues when I was a kid. He totally worked that together for my good. But when you're not growing and developing, you have a warped perspective. Dad is still this three-headed monster at times. Jesus' prayer in John 17, he was like, Father, I've done it. I've made known your name to humanity. He put a face to the Father's name, and he demonstrated the name of Yahweh to humanity. And then he had these other disciples he breathed on, and he gave them his spirit. And the spirit is like a signature. It's a sign sealed, this one belongs to me. The priests of old, man, when they would do their ministry, they had certain clothing they had to put on, and one of the pieces of clothing was a beautiful gold plate that was right mounted on their turban on their forehead. And it said this, it said, basically, I belong to Yahweh. And so every time they bumped into a fellow Israelite, that Israelite would look and be reminded, this cat, he belongs to Yahweh. And it would trigger something in them psychologically to go, whoa. And then it was a reflection, his name's over me too. And I'm not kidding you, I've, re I've, I've tried to simplify my approach with parenting, with walking with God. I hit 50 this year. And it is true, just like wine. You get better and better 
looking and tasting all that with age. It's true. Because now when I get squeezed by trial, good stuff comes out. Ten years ago when trials squeezed me, some nasty stuff came out. What was I saying? <laughs> Squeezed, yeah, squeezing. That doesn't matter. Yahweh's name over your life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine when your kid comes to you and is struggling immensely, and, and maybe it's a roommate, maybe you're single, maybe you're a single mom, maybe you're married, but imagine you're relating to another human that is in a moment of weakness, and you remember, I've got this thing on my forehead that says I belong to Yahweh. I got his spirit in me. Maybe I'm not supposed to be a dad right now, maybe I'm supposed to be a priest. Maybe their bad behavior isn't a reflection of me. Maybe they just need me to represent him. Imagine a husband and wife daily remembering, I can't treat you like you're common and ordinary. You belong to Yahweh. This isn't about being a better husband, better kid, better this, better that, better that. It's about Name, image, likeness. He formed you in his image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He's given you the capacity to become like him through the spirit of God and just simply yielding and humbling yourself. And he has put his name in you, over you. It's a brand. When I signed a Nike deal, I was required to wear Nike on the field. It's called brand loyalty. They could care less how I lived as long as I was loyal to the brand. And some of you are gonna mistake what I'm saying, but you gotta reduce it down. Your father is way less concerned about your behavior. It's so real to you because your behavior affects things around you and others. He's way more concerned about your loyalty. Good behavior follows loyalty. But good behavior doesn't give you acceptance. You're already his treasure. His instructions to grow and become like him are to give you the benefit of representing him well to humanity inside of your own home, outside of your home, and there's gonna be different seasons and different moments. I'm just encouraging you. Stand to your feet if you would. This is an awesome time to come back into alignment. This is an awesome time to go, Father, my picture of you is inaccurate and therefore I struggle with bearing your image well. This is an awesome time to go, Father, I, I've been away, I've been straying, but I come back. I, I wanna be fiercely, you have my yes, Hineni, here I am, Lord. I'm all in. These are wonderful times. Not everything's gonna get solved in these times, but these are wonderful times, wonderful moments when the father shows up and he goes, listen, my name is over you. It's a wonderful time to release and forgive other image bearers. Somebody else in humanity that misrepresented the father and it messed you up. This is an awesome opportunity to represent the father well and go, listen, in the house of worship, I'm gonna forgive and release that image bearer. They're formed in his image too. And we're in a season, this is all out important because listen to me, the attempt of the enemy in this season is to make us divided, make us non-human, to reduce us down to a problem and an enemy. 
Every one of your enemies, Jesus said, even your enemy is formed in his image. Pray for your enemy. That's a good instruction. So Lord, here we are, just a bunch of dirt filled with breath. So we're just dirt filled with his breath. Man, he signed that, he, he signatures over that. That's valuable dirt. That dirt went from being just dirt, when the spirit came into it, that dirt became the most valuable thing on the planet. Let him breathe on those areas that are still dirt. Let him breathe on it. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we come as those that need your work in our lives. Fill us with your presence right now. Lord, just like the priest would pray, Lord, bless us. Just say that, Lord, would you bless me? Would you bless my family? Lord, would you keep me? Would you literally keep me? Keep me, deliver me from the evil way. Keep me. Lord, would you turn your countenance to me right now? Would you literally turn your gaze to me right now? Would you fill me with hope? Would you fill me with healing? Would you fill me with your precious presence? Would you come now? And Lord, would you, would you dust off that name that's written over my life? Would you come now and do a refining work? Would you shine up that plate that says I'm set apart to you? Would you do something in my mindset, in my thought? right now? Would you align my very thinking to this truth that I'm experiencing this morning? And then, Father, would you take the words of truth and be, by your Spirit, just say, Spirit of God, would you take these words, these words of truth, and would you make this real to me? Would you put something in me? Would you write something new on my heart? And Lord, would you take this heart that sometimes get hard and stony? Would you make it fleshy again? Would you make it soft again? And would you begin to write a whole new playbook over my life. Real quick, look at somebody right by you and say, just begin to prophesy. Just begin to tell them, you are so valuable. His signature and name over your life. You are so amazing. You are so incredible. Look at somebody around you and say, I'm not going to let your weaknesses define our relationship. I speak life over you. I speak peace over you. I bless you. I honor you. Love you, Jesus.